And I will start the next section uh, and the very last section in this chapter, which is communication via diffusion. These are, of course, the more interesting topics. This is our own work. Uh, so, uh, besides ion signaling, uh, like castrum signaling is an example of ion signaling, there are also other methods of communication. Uh, remember, com uh, molecular communication is typically working with the release of many molecules from one point, from the sender uh, cell, typically towards the uh, destination cell, but uh, one was sending the, the, passing the molecules through the gap junctions. Now we are talking about releasing these molecules not through a gap junction, but to the environment, to the extracellular environment, so that these molecules diffuse in the environment towards the destination. Uh, so there is a transmitter cell that releases these molecules in the environment, and hopefully they will diffuse towards the destination and received by the destination. This type of communication is called communication via diffusion. We'll just uh, use the shorthand for that as CVD. Uh, we are going to encode the information using the molecules. So we're going to have a signal formed by molecules, carried by the molecules. So I have to encode the information somehow onto this molecule wave. And the feature I, I'm going to use for encoding this information will be different, as we will see. But the most frequently used one is the uh, concentration of the molecules in the environment. These molecules will diffuse in the environment, subject to Brownian motion, and hopefully, as we said, arrive at the receiver. Uh, the messenger molecules may be received by the uh, aimed target uh, cell, but it is also possible that these molecules with diffusion arrive at different cells. Okay? And if those cells have receptors for this type of molecule, they will receive it. But that will be actually an error because that's not the target cell. So that is something we need to also uh, pay attention to. Uh, so when these molecules <coughs> arrive at the destination cell, they will be uh, bound to that receptor, which will trigger an internal uh, chain of reactions. Hopefully, this, uh, the receiver cell will understand what has been sent accordingly, which means it has to do decoding of the signal. So it works very briefly as follows. We have the transmitter cell. Uh, as you will remember, we construct a vesicle and fill it with the messenger molecules. And this uh, vesicle will release these messenger molecules just to the environment, uh, at the, uh, just to the extracellular environment. All of these molecules, they're not thrown, they're just released to the environment. So due to the collisions with the other molecules uh, of the medium, these will make random movements. And we hope that most of them will go towards the destination. But as we will see, many of them will go to other places. So somehow we have to uh, deal with that. So, uh, like this molecule, hopefully, arrives at the uh, cell membrane here. What happens here is there are receptors on the cell membrane that can bind with these messenger molecules. There's a different receptor for every uh, for every different type of messenger molecule. So uh, messenger molecule A cannot bind to a receptor uh, for messenger molecules of type B. Okay? Of course, one question would be, what should be the frequency of, the, uh, of placing receptors on the cell membrane? We will assume that the number of receptors here is sufficient so that arriving at the cell membrane can be considered equal to being received. It's not like we have the cell membrane, but there's no receptor there, so the molecule just goes there, hits, and jumps back. We'll not have that case. Uh, actually, later we'll be talking about that, but uh, to cover uh, the uh, 
50% of the cell membrane having uh, 1 over 5,000 ratio of uh, receptors is sufficient, actually, due to uh, diffusion dynamics. So uh, we can safely assume that there are sufficient cells in the environment. Also, as these molecules are moving and they get very close to the receptor, the affinity of the receptor will attract the messenger molecule so that the messenger molecule is properly aligned and it can bind with the receptor. But the affinity works at very close proximity. It will not be able to pull uh, the molecules at, at a distance. So they will be, so the first thing we do is, I should find a way of representing my information on this molecule wave. That is called encoding. So I have to encode my information, typically ones and zeros, the bits, on this molecule wave. So how do I encode it? Is it on the concentration, frequency, what? On some feature of the wave, I should be able to uh, represent the information. The second case is I should be sending, releasing these molecules to the environment. So that's transmission phase. The third phase is these molecules should propagate through the medium towards the destination. And the fourth phase is receiving those molecules, the reception phase. And finally, the uh, fifth phase is once those molecules have been received, some number of molecules have been received, uh, how do I understand what was sent? That would be decoding, just the inverse of the first phase, which was encoding. So for every type of communication, there is an associated energy expenditure you should keep in mind. This has been uh, largely neglected in the uh, literature. People just uh, discuss the channel capacity. But we should also look at how much energy is being uh, spent to transmit that energy. Okay. So uh, this is the our work uh, in reference 18 is actually the first of its kind in the literature. This uh, studying the energy modeling of uh, diffusion communication via diffusion. The energy is spent for the following steps actually. The first step is you have to prepare the molecules. Remember, there was, a, uh, there was the encoding phase in the previous slide. To do the encoding, actually, you have to create those molecules. That's called the synthesis of those messenger molecules. And this requires energy. You don't get, uh, prepare those molecules without spending any energy. So the first step is it's synthesizing those messenger molecules. The second step is, how do you, do you have to carry these to the cell membrane so that you can throw them out in the uh, extracellular environment? But you cannot do it one by one. So you prepare many messenger molecules and then enclose them in what we call a vesicle, which is actually a bilipid layer, a spherical uh, shaped uh, container in which you can put your messenger molecules. But preparing that uh, vesicle itself also requires energy. So you should also take that into account. And the third phase is once this uh, vesicle has been prepared, you have to carry it from where it was constructed, where it was synthesized, to the cell membrane. And remember, we use the uh, microtubular network for this. So you have to attach it on uh, the back of a, uh, of a uh, molecular motor and then carry that load, that vesicle, with the molecular motor all the way to the cell membrane. Okay? And remember, this also has a cost. Remember, for each step you're taking here, you were spending on ATP. Remember the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP so that uh, the molecule of the molecular motor here 
uh, has a uh, change in its shape so that it takes a step. Every step actually takes one ATP. So that is the third step. And finally, you have to fuse this vesicle with the cell membrane so that the inside of the uh, vesicle now becomes the outer surface of the cell membrane so that all the molecules are now released to the extracellular environment. These four steps are actually consuming energy, so we should find out how much energy is being consumed for each step. So the total cost of sending N messenger molecules must be less than or equal to the energy that is reserved for transmission. Note that you cannot use the whole energy of the cell for communication. If you do that, you will have a talking dead cell. It will send the information and then it will die. Okay, so you have a limited energy budget, some percentage of your whole energy. Uh, you should consider that energy. If the energy production capability of a transmitter cell is high enough, that means considering the energy budget for communication to send N molecules, let's say, for a single symbol, you're not consuming all of your energy budget, why not have another vesicle of another symbol to send another symbol, another one, another one. Send as many symbols as you can in parallel as long as you're in the energy budget. This would actually mean parallel transmission of several symbols towards the destination. So that would typically increase your data rate since you're able to sell, send multiple symbols at the same time. Uh, but to do that, you should be using different types of molecules for each symbol. Otherwise, if you use the same type of symbol, then those symbols will be considered as a thing, uh, those molecules will be considered to represent a single molecule at the receiver side. So you should be uh, representing your molecules in different, using different uh, molecules if you apply that. But we should first check if you have sufficient energy for that. If the different molecules we are using do not affect each other, that means they do not go into chemical reaction with each other, so that they don't cancel each other out, this means that we have independent and parallel channels for transmission. The data can be represented by uh, considering a given uh, number of molecules arriving at the receiver during a given period of time. Okay? So you can look at it this way. I have a symbol to send, one or zero, let's say, simply. Remember, a symbol does not necessarily have to be one bit. For example, you can have one symbol, which represents, let's say, two bits, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. If that symbol has four different uh, four different values, then it will be representing two bits. If it can have eight different values, then it will be representing three bits. Okay? But for the sake of this uh, example, let's take it simple and say one symbol is equal to one bit. In that case, I will be sending one symbol, and to send a symbol, actually I'm sending n molecules, but remember, these molecules are going with Brownian motion, so not all of them will reach at the destination. Some of them will go the other way around. And also, I cannot wait indefinitely at the receiver side. So we call that a symbol duration. The moment I throw these N molecules to the environment, the symbol duration starts. And in, T, uh, in let's say, K units of time, the receiver has to decide whether what I sent was a one or a zero. That is called the symbol duration. So in a given symbol duration, uh, K of the N molecules should arrive at the destination. If K of these arrive, K or more of these arrive, 
The receiver decides what I sent was a one. If not, if the number of molecules received during that delta T symbol duration, or we will call it in short as T sub S, if less than K molecules have been received, the receiver decides that was a zero. Okay. So that is, for example, one way of encoding the information. However, if I, it, and if I'm trying to send a zero, for example, I will not send anything. I will just keep silent for some time, for the symbol duration. And the receiver uh, will, not, will receive less than k symbols and say, OK, the uh, sender send a zero. But the uh, sender sends zero molecules. How could the receiver receive more than zero molecules? That would be because of the fact that in the beginning, let's say, uh, the sender at the beginning of the symbol duration, the sender had sent 100 molecules. And let's say our threshold is 60 molecules. The value of k is 60. So if you send 100 molecules, let's say 70 of them arrive at the receiver during that symbol duration. It is above the threshold of 60. So you say, OK. Uh, I received more than 60, so this is a 1. Good. I sent one. The receiver understood it was a 1. Perfect. Now for the next symbol, I want to send a 0. But remember, for the previous one, I had sent 100, and 70 of them had arrived. So that means 30 of them are still wandering in the environment. Now, during the next symbol duration, some of those stray molecules in the environment may still arrive at the receiver. Okay? So it is possible that the receiver will receive more than uh, zero molecules, although none was sent. Further, uh, if I have yet another zero in the sequence at the sender, so also for the third symbol duration, I sent nothing. Still there could be few molecules that are received. Now, what if I was sending 110? In that case, I would send 170 received. For the second symbol, I sent 100 more. But remember, there were 30 remaining from the previous symbol. So in fact, now there are 130 in the environment. During the second symbol uh, duration, let's say 65 of them are received. There were 180, you received 65, so there are 65 remaining. Now, in the third symbol duration, where I sent zero symbols, there are already 65 in the environment. What if these, out of these 65, 60 or more of them arrive? The receiver would say, OK, I received more than 60, so the sender sent 111. Actually, I meant 110. So there is a cumulative effect also. You should also take that into account. This is called intersymbol interference. This is the interference between consecutive symbols. Okay? We will discuss more on that, but we have a question from Turul. Yes? Uh, I was thinking about uh, we should have, we should need a synchronization mechanism for this. Uh, for example, for the sender and the receiver? Yes. For example, sending it 0, 0, 0, you wait some time. Uh, it's uh, sending nothing, no molecules, and the receiver should understand that this time interval uh, corresponds to three zeros, actually. Uh, how, how do we achieve that? You're, you're very right. Uh, synchronization uh, between the uh, sender and the receiver is, uh, is an important problem. Once again? Start and end signals. Uh, okay. Uh, one way could be uh, before that you have another type of symbol now that will uh, show the start of transmission mm -hmm. and end of transmission. That could be one solution. One of your friends mentioned, yes, you said what? Mm -hmm. For synchronization? I, I said uh, uh, sorry, you said? Manchester encoding, differential Manchester encoding. How do you do that differential Manchester encoding or Manchester encoding? Manchester 
with these. For the signals, uh, there is a constant shape for zero and one, and you uh, send the signal with that encoding. Very good. Oh, I know. Very good. But that requires shaping the signal. What's the shape of my signal? I just. Uh, yeah, so it's like not just one or zero. It's like one zero or zero one, like the electric. We'll come to Hold it. Uh, do you see this part? If I draw something here on the camera? Okay. Okay. Now, okay. See, this is time. Okay. And this is the uh, number of molecules received in some given short duration, not the whole symbol duration, but you know, just uh, like the histogram of the received signals, or you may also plot the probability of it, it would be the same thing. I, uh, the transmitter releases the molecules at time t equals zero, okay? So, of course, nothing will be received immediately at the receiver, because there's some distance between uh, the sender and the receiver, and it will take time for even the shortest path, direct uh, transmission. Uh, to arrive, so for some time there will be nothing received, but then it will increase. Okay, increase, increase, and here you reach the peak. Then the number of molecules you receive will decrease. I'm talking about a single vesicle of molecules being sent. Okay, so. Starting from this point, you'll receive one molecule and then more and more and more, but then the number of molecules you're receiving will decrease. Okay? But this has a very long tail. Uh, so, this is the shape of my signal. Now, how do you do differential uh, Manchester encoding with this? Remember, in the case of differential Manchester encoding, you had different types of uh, signals for ones and zeros, but the important thing was there was a transition in the middle of the symbol that would help us to synchronize the transmitter and receiver clocks. That was a very good idea for electromagnetic uh, transmission. However, this is pretty difficult to implement with uh, molecular waves. What? Uh, how do you implement a high pass filter here? First of all, we don't have a negative value. Yes, you don't have a negative value, but just apply uh, some DC, so shift everything up. That could be solved. Uh, what happens here is actually you construct a uh, feedback mechanism between the two cells, and with this feedback mechanism, the transmitter and receiver synchronize. There's a paper by uh, Michael Moore in Bionetics 2011 uh, that discusses the synchronization of uh, transmitter and receiver cells. So there is a solution. Okay, but that was a very good question. That's important. Okay, so. Let's proceed from here. What we discussed here was, once again, remember, the topic has slightly changed. Uh, what we discussed was, I transmit a signal, uh, many molecules, but some of these molecules will be delayed. And if I start another symbol, these stray molecules from the previous symbol will be received uh, by the receiver, and the receiver is not shared between uh, the molecules of the first signal and the molecules of the second signal. Okay? Because all these molecules are following different paths. That's a problem. Also, there's one more thing to note. Now, if you count the total number of molecules received, consider a single symbol. The transmitter sends 100 molecules at time t equals zero. And you wait till infinity. You wait indefinitely and count the number of molecules you have received. How many molecules will you receive? 
Are you going to receive all? In an unbounded environment, no. In a bounded environment, yes, they will, if they're bouncing from the corners, at the end, finally, they will receive, uh, arrive at the receiver. But in the case of an unbounded environment, which is practically a very large area, so a very large environment could be considered as an unbounded uh, environment. In that case, some of the molecules will travel so far with Brownian motion that they will never, never arrive at the receiver. Okay? So you shouldn't wait for all 100 molecules to arrive. The idea is to count the number of molecules, and if it exceeds some threshold, which is definitely much less than what has been thrown into the environment, you should say that's enough. But when you say enough, don't forget that the remaining molecules are not destroyed. They're still in the environment. So you should be able to take care of that. In classical wired and wireless communication systems, there are several modulation techniques, uh, like uh, amplitude modulation, or we can call it amplitude shift keying, uh, or frequency shift keying. For Encoding your information on the signal. In the first one, you're encoding the information on the amplitude feature of the signal. In the second one, you're encoding it on the frequency uh, component of the signal. What does that mean? It means the following. To send a one in the case of amplitude shift keying, let's say you represent one by throwing 100 molecules. And you represent a zero by uh, transmitting, for example, zero molecules. Or if you want, you can say it's 20 or something different. Okay? There, the amplitude is changing. For one, it's a higher amplitude. For zero, it's a smaller amplitude. So we're encoding the information on the amplitude. In the second one, we're encoding it on the frequency. For example, you change the frequency of the signal. For one, let's say, you take 100 kilohertz, for zero you take 50 kilohertz, or vice versa, whatever. Some different frequency values. So the receiver can understand that. Okay? So uh, you could maybe use such values, but the problem is these uh, are, uh, especially frequency shift keying is difficult to implement in the case of molecular waves, and amplitude shift keying is subject to too much attenuation. Okay, so one thing we can do is uh, concentration shift keying, okay, which is actually very similar to amplitude shift keying. You represent the information in different concentrations of the uh, messenger molecules. Another one is the molecular uh, molecule shift keying, which is using type A for one, type B for zero, for example changing types. In concentration shift keying, the number of received molecules represents different values for the symbols during a symbol duration. And this is com uh, compared against a threshold. And if you use multiple threshold values, then you can have more bits transmitted per one symbol. Okay? Like if you have three thresholds, that means it will define four ranges okay, for different intervals with three uh, uh, thresholds, then you can represent two bits per symbol. Okay? But this is subject to uh, high error because if uh, th these thresholds are not separated far enough and uh, due to diffusion, if the distance between the cells is large, you may send a zero zero, which could easily be understood as a zero one or one zero. Uh, and also, so due to bad channel conditions, the lagging molecules will cause some error, and these errors may cause you to misinterpret at the receiver side uh, of the transmitted signal. In the case of molecule shift keying, as we said, we're using different types for different bits. 
or different symbols, symbol values. Okay? So this is, for example, the, uh, one of our proposed methods for a, sing, uh, for a two bits per symbol system. Uh, we have a carbon chain. Look at the middle two carbons. One side of these uh, carbons is hydrogen, and the other side, which is written in blue or green here, is flexible. If you attach here a hydrogen, we will, we will use hydrogen, for example, to represent a zero, and a fluorine to represent a one. So this molecule represents zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Uh, and this is the header and the trailer of your molecule marking the ends. Okay? That is fixed for all. The reason the header and the trailer are different is the following. This molecule, when released to the environment, may flip in three dimensions. So you can't guarantee that it will arrive uh, at a specific orientation at the receiver. You cannot say, I just released the molecule uh, in a, let's say, a horizontal uh, orientation from here, and it will always go like this. This will ch turn in three dimensions. So you may easily understand a zero one as a one zero or vice versa. Okay? So to make sure that the header and the trailer are different, and the difference is at these two uh, bonds at those two positions. So now I can, if I send, uh, if I receive this molecule, I know it's a zero, zero. Okay? Now, uh, don't try this at home, because if you try to send such a molecule, it may kill the uh, receiving cell or it may even explode. I don't know what will happen with this. This was just to show the idea, okay? We don't mean to use, we don't really mean to use this molecule, okay? This is just a concept. We can synthesize molecules which are friendly with the cells. This is, uh, the term for this is biocompatible. So you can define biocompatible messenger molecules which will be different for each symbol value. Okay? If you can define more possible values, then you can have more bits per symbol. Okay, so this was the uh, molecular shift keying approach. Like any other wired or wireless uh, communication mechanism, uh, communication by diffusion also suffers from interference in different ways. There are different types of interference and you will have almost all of them uh, in the case of also communication via diffusion. One of them um, is the inter-symbol interference we have just discussed. That is the interference between the symbols of the same communication, between the consecutive symbols. Another one is adjacent channel interference. That is the interference caused by a given channel over the neighboring channels. If the channels interfere with each other. If the molecules can, for example, uh, have chemical uh, reactions in between. And another one is the co-channel interference. In the case of uh, co-channel interference, like two nodes are communicating here using type A molecule. There, I also have two more nodes that need to communicate here. Can I use type A also between these two uh, molecules? These are two independent pairs of communicating uh, cells, but can I use the same type of molecule at this distance? If not, what is the closest distance at which I can reuse that type A molecule for transmission? Okay, so to understand, to find this distance, you have to know how much interference you have between this channel, the channel between these two cells, and the channel between these two cells. That is the co-channel interference. So that's 
something we discussed uh, later on. If I'm not wrong, that was 19 or 20. So, uh, to study the, uh, how we manage the symbol duration and how we do this, uh, take care of this problem, let's look at this. Actually, this is the same thing, redrawn here. Okay? If you just, it looks like this is at zero starting from a very high value. That's not the case. If you zoom in here, actually, you see this behavior, but this is going very steeply. So we have just zoomed out to see what's really happening. So at time zero, you transmit, and since you're talking about very short distance, if I'm not wrong, this was for 10 uh, micrometer distance between the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, very shortly after t equals zero, the receiver will start receiving molecules and immediately it will start receiving many molecules. So this end is really very steep. And as you can see, the top is also not shown in the figure. But then it will start decreasing, but it won't stop. As you can see, I still have some received molecules here. So when can I say, okay, that's the end of symbol, uh, this symbol, let me transmit the next symbol. When, do I, when can I start the next one? Or when do I stop the current one? You have to apply a threshold. Okay? So this is what we call the cutoff time. When do I cut the symbol and start the next symbol? Okay? In our simulations, what we did was the following. We tried this. Now, there's no analytical work uh, behind this. This is still an open problem. But uh, we just found, it this, uh, found this with trial and error. What we did was the following. Now, you transmit, let's say, 100 molecules. As I said earlier, don't expect 100 of them to arrive at the destination. Due to the unbounded uh, environment, some of them will get lost. So take those that have arrived. We waited for very long times. So that for a long time, we don't see any received molecules. So we can conclude that all the molecules in the environment that have the probability of arriving have already arrived. So among those we have received, let's say 90 of them, just making up the numbers at the moment. Take that and take 60% of that. That's where I stop. That means I will wait for the first 60% of the molecules that may arrive and take, decide what the symbol is based on that 60% and then start the next symbol, which means the remaining 40% will constitute the inter-symbol interference for me. And I'm willing to tolerate that. Now you might say, why do you take 60%? Why not take 70 or 50? You could do that. That's what we found with trial and error. 60 was good enough. 60 was sufficient for us to decode it. But that really uh, still requires some analytic work. Yes, ma'am? Uh, how do you calculate 60? Because I don't think that we have the information of how many uh, transmitter, uh, transmitting molecules will come. Where do you know this? Uh, as I said, we didn't uh, have an analytical uh, calculation for that. This was just with trial and error. Okay, so as I said, you might say, why take 60, let me take 70. Yes, you can do that. But if you take 70, that means you're moving this red bar to the right, which means you're extending your symbol duration. This will make sure that you have received more molecules so that you can make a better decision on whether that was a one or zero. However, since your symbol duration is longer, the next symbol can be sent later. So let's say in uh, 30 minutes, the number of symbols you can send is lower than the number of symbols I can send. In other words, my system with 60% threshold cutoff would work faster than your system with 70% cutoff. Okay? But when I say this, now Emre will say, then I will make it 50, so mine will be the fastest. 
Okay? False. He's partly correct. Partly correct. But see, when he says 50, he's take, moving this line to the left, which means he will experience more errors. So there you have the trade-off. Because if he moves this left, left, and left, as you go left, you will have shorter symbol durations, which means more frequent symbols. So you can send more. But the problem is, are you able to decode more correctly? If inter-symbol interference increases when you move this, the, cur uh, the area be below this curve is your error, actually. Is what is causing the error. As you move this line to the left, that means you're willing to operate at a higher error environment. But those errors will cause mis-decoding. So you will make errors also in decoding. So if you look at the net gain, how many bits did I send? And how many of them were correctly decoded? Probably the method Emre has uh, proposed, which is moving this 60% cutoff to 50, probably what he has proposed will be worse than what I'm doing. Maybe not. Since I didn't prove it analytically, he might be just correct by chance. And pay attention, sorry, pay attention. This 60%, 50%, 70%, whatever it is, this is valid for the parameters I'm using. That means change the diffusion coefficient, change the number of molecules that are transmitted, change the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. This cutoff should change. This is the, this is the, uh, this seems to be not the optimal, but a good enough cutoff value for the parameter set with which I have run these examples, uh, this scenario. Change the scenario slightly, that 60% also needs to change. What should that correct value be? We should have an analysis of this. Okay? That, as I said, is an open problem. That's something we didn't do. We dwelled into other problems. If you're interested in doing research here, that's one of the things you need to attack. And that's also one of the things we're planning to attack. So if you do it earlier, you publish the paper. If not, I do publish it. This is part of our Tubitech project uh, problems. Yeah. Sorry, uh, for this example, what was the error ratio for 60%? For example? Ideally, you don't remember it. I mean, this, it has been about two or three years since we had those examples, and we, had, we run so many different scenarios that I don't remember everything by heart. Um, yes? Would it be possible if, to increase the performance if you send less um, molecules, if you have two ones, so there are some um, molecules left of the last? Um, you mean if I decrease the number of molecules I have released in the very beginning? once um, in a row, so you have some left from the first. Uh, I see. So, uh, uh, set the threshold if you send a zero higher than. Clever boy, we did it. <laughs> yes, uh, your friend's question. Let me repeat it. Is the following? Uh, actually, the error will change if you have a sequence of one one or 0, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 0. It will be different for each. He's right. So actually, that means you should apply different thresholds. In other words, if you have already received a 1 in the previous symbol, you already know that there will be some stray molecules in the environment which are expected to be received during the current symbol I'm now looking at. So if I can estimate, see, I don't know exactly how many there will be, but if I can estimate how many stray molecules will be received from the previous symbol, 
And if I count the number of uh, molecules I really receive, did you subtract those stay molecules from the previous uh, cell? And now look at that. Okay. Or another method of this would be change the threshold adaptively. Same thing. Okay. You either subtract the effect of the previous symbol on the current symbol and treat it this, with the same threshold, or don't do the subtraction, but move the threshold up or down. That could be done, and yes, we did. Yes, we did it. With Ali uh, Akkay, we have done that. And also with Shukra. So yes, you're right, it has an effect, and it should be considered. If you have one, 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 and then a zero, this is different from having zero, 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 and a zero. You're right. Uh, so, any other questions about this? We are, uh, I mean, we are accepting that the receipt sender and the receiver are just fixed, not the moving one. Uh, yeah, we are assuming that the uh, transmitter and receiver cells are fixed, they're not mobile. We are assuming that uh, there are no uh, other cells in the environment communicating with this type of molecule. We are assuming that the transmitter and the receiver are, uh, uh, are synchronized. So yes, we are all assuming these. Well, for the case of synchronization, as I said, that problem is already solved. So you just make use of that uh, information. For example, you use another type B molecule in the background just for the synchronization purpose so that the transmitter receiver clocks are synchronized. Uh, for the uh, co-channel interference case, as I said, we have already studied it in another paper the effect of that. So in this paper, uh, this was the first one. Uh, we ignore that. But then we have also studied the effect of also that one. Uh, uh, so yes, there are such assumptions uh, in here. So how do we understand whether the uh, also, there's one more thing we're uh, assuming. I was just trying to remember that, and I did remember. We're assuming that I know the distance to the receiver. Okay, that could be solved before doing, uh, before transmitting the information. You may have a channel tuning or channel measurement phase where the two uh, parties send messages to each other so that uh, you do what we call ranging between the transmitter and receiver. And this comes after ranging. So we are discussing what's happening after ranging. Okay. This is, you're right, it's like pinging. Like uh, to do ranging, uh, we work with a known protocol. So I say, let's start ranging. So when I say let's start ranging, that means I will send you 100 molecules and see what's happening. From this, you will understand the channel in between. And then you send me 100 molecules, and I look at how many I receive in given duration. So I also understand how the channel is. Okay? Of course, you may need to repeat this once in a while because the channel may change. But we are all skipping those details and looking at the base case. So. How do we uh, detect what was sent? Okay. To do that, we should be able to find out what the probability of hit is given for a given symbol duration. Okay. So let's denote the probability of a single messenger molecule. See, as I said, we are actually sending many of these. But let's first look at a single molecule. Uh, so, what's the probability of a single molecule arriving at the receiver cell, which is at a distance of d to the transmitter, and the transmitter waits, uh, sorry, the receiver waits for a duration of ts. 
So we know when the symbol duration has started, we wait for ts seconds, let's say. And what's the probability of having this? Try this experiment many times and find the average. Typically use Monte Carlo simulation to find the probability of hit. That we will denote with probability of hit at a distance of d for a given symbol duration of ts. Then the probability that n such molecules hit the receiver is a, a process and c of n, which is actually a binomial process where n is the number of released molecules and each one is subject to p hit of d and ts. Okay? It's a binomial distribution. It's coming from a binomial distribution. Here, by the way, we are assuming that the messenger molecules do not collide. In our simulations, we didn't simulate that case. But this is very, very unlikely. In the three-dimensional space, the probability that two molecules find each other and hit each other, this is very unlikely. So we just ignore that in our simulations. The surplus molecules, the stray molecules from uh, the current symbol will cause inter-symbol interference uh, for the next symbol, we know that. And that would be represented as NP of N, which is again a binomial distribution. It's coming from a binomial distribution, which is actually the subtraction of two binomial distributions. This represents the uh, number of molecules that will be received in two symbol durations, one for the previous symbol and one for the current symbol. So you send it twice and subtract those that arrived during the previous symbol duration because they already arrived at the correct symbol duration. Subtract that. This is the inter-symbol interference you will experience, okay? And here uh, in the notation, the C here stands for the current symbol and P stands for the uh, previous symbol. And the lowercase n's here represent the number of molecules that were released from the transmitter. And there will be also free roaming or stray molecules that will cause noise. So we will assume so at the white cause in noise with mean uh, zero and with some variance sigma. So considering all these sources, let us denote the probability of successful reception. Probability of successful reception is P of R. Given that the previous symbol was S, of S sub P and the current symbol is S sub C. Okay? Then the probability of incorrect decoding will be denoted by P of X, P sub X, sorry. And the threshold, as I say, is tau of uh, tau uh, sub SP, where tau, the threshold, is determined as Thomas already mentioned depending on the previous symbol. If the previous symbol was one, since I expect some surplus molecules also to the symbol, I will increase tau. If it was zero, it will be lower. Okay, so it's different uh, tau values depending on the previous symbol, sp. Okay? Symbol or symbols? Maybe. Symbol, uh, okay, uh, good point. In here, what we studied was the following. We studied, uh, I forgot to mention that it's uh, good that you reminded. it. We studied the effect, uh, the inter-symbol interference effect of a symbol on the next symbol and the one following that and the one following that. We have studied several consecutive symbols. We have seen that every transmission has some effect a transmission of one, of course, because there you have more molecules released. Uh, for the case of zero, we were assuming no release. Uh, every symbol has an effect in the following, in the next symbol, but the effect on the other 
following symbols can be simply neglected. That is very low. That's almost equal to the noise in the environment. So we just ignore that. Of course, if you make the symbol durations very short, then you have to con consider that. But 60% was enough for us to ignore the second next, third next, fourth next symbols. Okay? If you need to also consider that, then you have to rewrite this, like making it three here, but then consider TS and two TS in that case. And also here, then you should have two indexes for each symbol and more cases, of course. Even with one, we have four different cases. And these are what? Probability of successful reception for this one. See, this is PR. So this is successful reception, successful reception. This one is failure. This one's failure. The difference is that this is the probability of successful reception. Given the current symbol transmitted signal is zero. And this is for the case of one. Where the previous symbol was SP, whatever SP is. Plug in either zero or one for this one. And this is a similar thing for unsuccessful or failed receptions, receptions which, mean, which means here, since it's a successful, zero was transmitted and I should decide zero. Zero was transmitted, I should decide one. One was transmitted and this is successful, so I should decide one. One was transmitted, but I should decide zero. Okay? And you see that, actually. Probability that, probability of successful reception, in the case that the previous symbol was zero. Sorry, uh, the current symbol uh, is zero. And the previous one uh, was SP, is what? Probability of receiving uh, Uh, the symbols, uh, let me see, uh, the previous, uh, those that were uh, received, let me say, during the previous symbol duration, uh, SP of them, whatever SP is, d depends on, uh, this is a different number for the case SP is zero or if it's one. The number that are currently received, okay, and uh, the noise in the environment. So this is the total number of molecules that are received. Those that are coming from the current symbol, those that are remaining from the previous symbol, whatever that previous symbol was, and those that are due to the noise in the environment. All these should be below the threshold so that I decide on a zero while the real transmitted signal is also zero. For the case of error, I should decide on one, therefore it has to be above the threshold. Just the inverse in here, the number of received molecules now should exceed the threshold so that I decide on one because what was transmitted was already one. And for the case of error, I should have decided on a zero, although a one was transmitted. Okay? And all these are written relative to the value of SP, whatever SP is. You may say, for example, I'm going to have different, uh, you don't have to have zero molecules transmitted for a zero. For the case of zero, you may say, I'm going to transmit 20 molecules. For one, I'm going to send 100 molecules. So in that case, here, this would correspond to 20 molecules being released. So this is a more general formalization. OK? So as you said, what we have done in the previous cases was we considered only a, uh, we considered a binary channel uh, where you transmit a 0 or a 1. And we're uh, hoping that a transmitted 1 will be received as 1, uh, where uh, as actually a transmitted one could have been received as a zero, which will represent an error. But another error condition is 
when you transmit as zero, it could be easily also understood as one. Correct reception would be zero, zero. Now, this would be a binary channel. You could also have a quadruple channel where you present zero, one, two, and three. These are four different possible values you can have for the symbol. Like, for example, let's say you're throwing out 1,000 molecules, let's say. If it's something between zero and, let's say, 250, you'd say it's a zero. 250 and 500 is one, 500, 750 range is uh, two, and 750 to 1,000 is, let's say, uh, is three. In that case, you would be able to represent two bits in one symbol. That means in one symbol duration, you would have sent two bits. So as long as it's successful, you would have twice the data rate. But the distance between one and zero, or zero, one, two, and three, they should be far apart so that since when you send a one, it's not, uh, if, let me say, if you send, let's say, 400 uh, molecules, it's not received as 400 molecules here. It's maybe less, or maybe even more, because of the stray molecules from the uh, previous symbol, plus the noise. So, uh, since any, you receive anything here, this thing should be far different from what you receive for the case of two. If they overlap, you can easily misdecode a one as two or two as one, whatever. Okay. So uh, the bold lines here show the probability of successful reception, and the dashed lines show the probability of uh, unsuccessful uh, reception or decoding. It's also possible to consider a ternary channel for the case of actually binary values to separate these one and zero cases and also to allow for the case that there is no transmission. It's possible that the sender is not sending anything. In the previous case, we were assuming that you're always sending a one or a zero. There is also the possibility of silence. So to consider the case of silence, you may have a third case. That's where you have a turn in channel. But still in that case, there are possible errors like you send a one, but it is misunderstood as silence or maybe as zero. Of course, the probability of understanding one as silence would be higher compared to understanding one as zero, since this is further. You can apply a double thresholding mechanism to distinguish between the three symbols, where y sub i is the number of molecules arriving at the receiver within a single symbol duration. So you have some information to be transmitted. This is encoded into the symbol, which is a function of time. So let's show it as x of t. And you transmit it over the channel. And the channel will, of course, distort what has been transmitted. So you send x of t, it is modified by the channel as y of t. So that's what the receiver receives. The receiver receives y of t, and from y of t, the receiver is expected to understand the w you sent here. But in fact, what it receives will be w prime. That w prime could be the same as w. In that case, that's a successful reception, but it could also be different. So W prime could be here a zero or one or, for example, a silence. So uh, if you have two thresholds, if the observed value of Y, as shown as Y sub R here, is greater than some threshold B, then you decide it's a one. If it is uh, less than A, you, you decide it's silence. If it's in between, then you decide it's zero, or you can change the order if you wish. In the case where more than one pair of transmitter receiver cells reside in the medium, then we have the co-channel interference problem, as we mentioned. That is the uh, interference between two disjoint 
transmission pairs, but since they're in close proximity, the transmitted signal by one of the transmitters is received by the receiver of the other pair. That is co-channel interference. Okay? Since now uh, we're doing the communication by making use of molecules, the molecules, uh, so we're discussing a case where you have, let me show it here as, you have A and B communicating and C and D communicating in close proximity. A releases the molecules, some of them hopefully will go to B, but there will be also molecules that go to D due to uh, the uh, random movement uh, with Brownian motion. There will also, of course, some that arrive at C, but since C does not have receptors, C is sending these molecules, but it doesn't have receptors for that. They will not be able to, since these are cells, let me show them as spheres here. These will come to the sphere, to the cell, but they will not be taken, so it will still be in the environment and it will keep on moving around. Maybe they will go to D, maybe they will go to B, we don't know. Okay? But all uh, cases are possible. So the interference between, uh, the interference due to these molecules suffered by D is a co-channel interference due to the AB communication on the CD communication. Okay? That's the co-channel interference. Some molecules, as we said, do not reach the receiver at all, but since they're in the environment, they may be received by unintended receivers. So let's denote the probability hit uh, of reception, correct, uh, right reception or correct reception, when the pairs are at a distance of D, sorry, not the pairs, but the transmitter and the receiver are at a distance of D to each other with a given symbol duration. So this is the probability of hit of a single molecule, don't forget, uh, to arrive at the correct receiver when the transmitter and the receiver are separated by a distance of D during one symbol duration. And the same probability with W at the top uh, is showing the probability of arriving at the wrong receiver. Then we can say, uh, we can uh, talk about the binomial distribution where we are sending N molecules and uh, this is the probability of hit at the correct receiver. So this is the uh, probability mass function of the number of molecules out of these N transmitted molecules. The probability of mass for uh, the number of molecules that hit the correct receiver. And same thing with W here shows the uh, probability of mass function uh, for the molecules that arrive at the wrong receiver. Then the number of molecules that are received is the sum of these four terms. The first one is the uh, number of molecules uh, that are received by the correct receiver during the current symbol duration. The third one is the number of molecules that arrive at the wrong receiver again during the current uh, symbol. The second is the number of uh, molecules that arrive at the correct receiver, but they were sent during the previous symbol. So they arrive at the correct destination, but they're late. So this constitutes the intersymbol interference for us. This one, the third term here, constitutes the uh, co-channel interference because it arrives at the correct time but at the wrong receiver. The fourth one is everything going wrong. It arrives at the wrong receiver and also it's delayed, probably because it's going through the long path. So this is intersymbol interference and co-channel interference combined. Okay, so the only correct one is actually this one. But 
you will have the sum of all these received. So you have to decode it correctly from n. That's what you have in your hand. n is due to these four terms, but you don't get these terms separately, one by one. You get the sum of it. And you have to deduce this, only the first term, by just looking at n. Which means you have to predict the other three and subtract them from n so that you end up with this and make a correct decision. Okay? So the building blocks of the total number of uh, received signals from all these is as follows. And C of R, this term, the first one, which was what we wanted, is a binomial distribution where we're releasing n molecules and subjective probability of hit at the correct receiver in the given symbol duration. Probability of arriving at the correct receiver uh, during the wrong, uh, uh, sorry, from the previous symbol duration is what? Look at the number of molecules that arrive in two symbol duration, okay? Subtract that arrive at the correct receiver during the correct duration because they're now, now in the uh, next symbol duration. Okay, so these are the ones that arrived at the correct destination during the previous symbol, so they don't constitute uh, coach, uh, sorry, inter-symbol interference for me. This is, remember, uh, the uh, co-channel interference. They arrive at the, during the correct uh, symbol duration, but at the wrong destination. That would be same as this one, except that it's a different uh, probability of hit value because it's at a different uh, distance at a different location. And this is very similar to that one, but this is the total number of molecules that arrive at the wrong destination in two symbol durations minus those that arrived during the previous symbol because they are now removed from the environment. So for both inter-symbol interference and co-channel interference cases, these probabilities can be uh, used for calculating the channel capacity and how it degrades by depending on all these factors. So that would be the end of this chapter. And again, at the end of the chapter, you have the related references. Uh, among these, the last few uh, will be our own publications. Number 18 is our publication uh, in uh, Azevir Nanocommunications Network. This is, as I said, the first uh, paper on the energy model of communication via diffusion in the literature. The second one is our paper in ICC with Professor Akhilis, which is on the modulation techniques. This one discusses that uh, uh, molecular shift keying uh, and concentration shift keying approaches. And uh, the last one uh, is our paper, again, uh, with Shukshu in bio-inspired models of networks, uh, the Bionetics Conference, uh, on co-channel interference for communication biodiffusion uh, in molecular communication. This is the last few slides we have discussed. Okay, that would be the end of our uh, lecture today.